Okay, thank you so much. And welcome, everyone. Very, very excited to be with you this evening. Hope everyone had a really productive and great Monday. And just want to welcome you into a, a fun topic. This is a topic that I really love to discuss. Obviously, local anesthesia and dentistry go hand in hand. It doesn't really matter what exactly your specialty is or the procedure that you're doing on a given day or hour, but local anesthesia is going to be a big part of your treatment plan. And the reality is, is that this has been an area that I've really tried to find ways to get a win-win. And by win-win, as I'll discuss, I mean a win for my patient, of course, but then also a win for me. And I think that there is technology available, which I'm going to go over and, and discuss with you, that can be really helpful in that regard. So listen, it's the local anesthetic cartridge and the solution inside that's the magic. How we deliver it, how we get it in there, that can ultimately be a big part of how successful we are as dentists, because technique uh, philosophy, the way that we do it is really, really important. So um, anyway, I welcome you in. Um, again, I'm Dr. Brett Gilbert. If you're not familiar with me, um, I'm an endodontist. I'm board certified endodontist here in Chicago. I just love dentistry. I love endodontics. Um, I also love personal growth and development. So um, I'll give you my socials later. But um, if you want to give me a follow on social media, um, I try to post pertinent topics to both. You know, we are human beings first. And we wear that white coat or those scrubs. And so we have to be taking good care of ourselves so that we have so much more to give to our patients. So uh, very excited to be with you again. Um, I did train in Maryland. That's where I'm from originally. I do have a private practice here in Chicago, King Endodontics. And I do teach at the University of Illinois as well. So uh, always excited to join a group like Catapult, who's really trying to push education forward. So I'm um, excited. So let's talk about dentistry, right? It's just full of challenges, quite honestly. It has amazing rewards and it's an incredible profession where you can go home and you can feel good about what you did, you know, especially in light of where we are in the world. There's so much negativity. There's so much ugliness, let's call it. But in our dental offices, we can provide an environment that's full of care and love. It's full of just, you know, treating people with respect and dignity and trying to do the best that we can to help them with their dental health. But in reality, to do that on a day in, day out basis, it can be really stressful. And one of the most stressful scenarios we all know is having the clock ticking on you all day long, tick, tick, tick. And ultimately, when you're in a situation where you have everything ready to go for root canal procedure and that clock is ticking and you can't get a patient to get fully numb, that's where the stress level just goes to high because you haven't even started yet. And you, you can see the whole mountain that you have to yet climb to get through an endodontic case, get a patient out of pain, and it becomes very stressful. And that compounds on top of all the other stresses we have. I love this diagram, you know, all the different things that we as human beings first, dentist second, and then all the other roles that we play, we have to deal with. So what I like to try to do is find ways to teach what's, what's working. Right. So if you are a dentist who likes to do endo or if you're a dentist that wants to do more, being good at local anesthesia and really understanding the nuances of how to treat a tooth that needs operative like a DO on number 14 versus irreversible pulpitis on 14 and needs endo. There are definitely nuances to the anesthesia. And my hope is, is that when you walk away from this evening, you'll feel much more comfortable about not only what you need to do, but how you need to do it. And most importantly, how we communicate to our patients about that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about pain points. When you hear the word pain point, you know, it's really more of a business term, quite honestly, but I picked out a few little, little um, definitions here because when I would think about local anesthesia in my practice, I would look at it as a pain point because I always felt physically so uncomfortable, you know, and, and to give you an example, you know, if you have this syringe in your hand and you're trying to get going here and then you start to maybe give a little rub and shake, which I'll talk about, and then you finally get it up into position and now I'm stuck in this static position for however long it takes me to drain this carpule and I have to push it out with my thumb, which is already on overdrive from all the endo I'm doing. And it was a pain point. And I would get into this position every hour, every day. And I would think to myself, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. So I think it's important as dentists and even just in everyday life 
to start to identify those pain points because these are things that take take the love out of what you do. These are the things that on a daily basis become that negative that you don't really need. Because as I showed you on the last slide, we have enough stress to deal with. But a pain point, um, again, I like this on the left, you know, a small area on the body that is sensitive to pain. And it's funny because when I was thinking about it as a pain point, I really meant it as just a difficult moment, right? Like you can see a persistent or recurring problem on the right side, a recurring, a recurring source of trouble, annoyance, or distress. But then when I flip back to number two on the left side, the small area that became sensitive to pain for me was my left shoulder. And I'll discuss that quite a bit because I was so concerned about the patient's comfort that I would get my arm up like this and I would want to do some massaging, which I'll talk about why that's important. And I just found that I got a pain point in my shoulder. So I was really searching for solutions for years. And I'm going to be able to present this evening about what that solution is. And it's really helped me quite a bit. So again, a win-win. I really look for this as a really important part of our practices because we always will bend over backwards for our patient. We always will compromise our body for our patient. That's something that we do. Now, we had dental school instructors that talked about ergonomics, but when push comes to shove and it's on and you're in a live procedure and you have a live patient in your chair and it's your job to get them better, you will compromise your body to help them. Now, the younger you are, the easier it is. And of course, the repercussions of it are smaller. But as you get a bit older and you've been practicing for quite a long time, I've been practicing now for 20 years, which is amazing to even say, it's almost hard to believe, but I've lived each of those 20, I can tell you that, the body starts to not be quite as resilient from putting ourselves in these weird positions. So. I look at a win-win as a way in which I can make sure that my patient gets the best, that everything is as comfortable and easy as that can be for them, but then my body also gets to win, meaning that technology helps me to perform a task that I was doing in a different way, perform it better for the patient, but also better for my body. And so uh, definition of a win-win, advantageous or satisfactory to all parties involved. So why do I love endo? Because we stop the pain, right? The, the pain is the thing. When you are a dentist that can get patients out of pain, there is no greater way to build a practice. Patients that you get out of pain will love you forever because the truth is, is that life for those patients literally stops. Nothing is important. Nothing gets done. There's no concentration until that pain goes away. It's so, it's so intense. I had a patient just before this webinar today that was in so much pain, they, they couldn't even think. And endo stops that pain. But in order to get a patient from there, and you see that red on her cheek, in order to get her from there back to normal, we have to do an awful lot to shut down what's happening inside of that tooth. Because the pain inside of the tooth that is inflamed is a totally different tissue, et cetera, than what it would be normally. So what I really want to cover and what I would love for you to walk away with from this webinar is number one, having more confidence in how to anesthetize the hot tooth. This is one of the questions I get the most. And I do a lot of teaching online. I do a lot of teaching at conferences, et cetera. I mentor a lot of dentists. This is one of those really vexing problems for dentists. And partly it's because of, you know, understanding that there is no perfect way, right? It's a, it's a combination of assessments, of communication, and ultimately technique that allows us to get to the point where we can remove that pulpal tissue. But I love this picture, right? Because this is what it is. It's basically like a bomb is going off inside of the tooth and the patient is simply suffering. So the idea that a simple couple of, anest uh, couple of carpules of anesthetic is going to calm that fire, we have to be realistic about it. The other thing I really want to be clear on is there is, a, it's not like the endodontist is just magically getting every patient perfectly numb on the first try. That's not really how this game works. So what I want to do is walk you through the whole sequence, what to say, what to do, how to handle the situation, because I swear the, the anesthetic is important, right? The technique is important, but what you say is even more important to be able to keep your patient calm, comfortable, and moving along toward the end of the procedure. So let's talk about how we deal with the tooth on fire. 
So let's look at what the difference really is, right? When we're dealing with a hot tooth versus a normal tooth. And really what it's about is inflammatory mediators, pain mediators, bradykinin, substance P, all kinds of different mediators infiltrate that pulpal tissue and in essence really change it. You know, you've seen that situation where maybe you had a pulpal exposure and you saw that the pulp looked almost gray and gelatinous. That's what it looks like in normal health. But when you get into an inflamed pulp, then it looks like just it's fire engine red and it's bleeding. And this tooth I opened just earlier, just a couple hours ago, it was just just blood just pouring out of it. And why? Because the inflammatory cells and mediators have come to play to try to address the changes from, from the tissue starting to become bombarded, whether it's decay, a crack, um, some type of agitation. And so what's important to realize is that this right here is the first thing we have to tell our patient. We have to explain to them like, yeah, I understand. Boy, I can see you're in a lot of pain. Well, I just want you to know the tissue inside your tooth has really undergone a lot of changes. So we're going to, of course, make sure that this is very comfortable for you. But I just want you to remember, there is a possibility you might feel something a little sharp or a little cold once I get started. And I just want you to let me know as soon as you feel anything like that, because it's totally normal. That's why you're in so much pain. And so I, I will help you along the way, but I just don't want you to get upset if as we're working, you feel a little something, you would be surprised how far that goes. Because when you anesthetize a patient, you sit down, you get going, and then you get started and the patient feels it. And you're like, whoa, did you feel that? Now the patient's just freaked out. And the reality is, is that a lot of the discomfort a patient might feel when you enter into an irreversible pulpitis isn't, isn't like dire pain, but it startles them because they were anticipating feeling nothing. So our communication is important. It starts right here with this picture. This is a different nature of tissue than what a normal tooth is. Because if a patient's never had endo, they're just used to getting numb really quickly for a filling, right? So it's important for us to explain that. So I just want you to have this picture in your mind. It's an important one. And this is really what it looks like ultimately. So this is just a view in, and this is a case that I've, I filmed, I have up on YouTube, but it gives you just sort of a great example of what that inflammatory tissue really looks like. That does not look like a gray gelatinous pulp tissue. That looks like something that's on fire. And so we have to have this all in mind so that our communication is on point with our patients. So um, let's talk just briefly about the anesthetic solutions. This is nothing different. You have likely have all this in your practice right now, just like I do. Um, obviously the lidocaine, HCL 2%. So it's gonna have the one to 100,000 epi. So this is going to be your standard dosage. I'll use this for all my lower blocks. Uh, the reason I use this over septicane, many of you may have seen in the past, there have been some studies that have made the mention that you may have a greater incidence of paresthesia with septicane, which is articane, versus lidocaine. Now, I don't know that I really truly believe that, but I sure know that if there is going to be a paresthesia, and you use the solution that's been implicated in this, that could be problematic. That's something an attorney will grab onto. So for lower blocks, I always use lidocaine, 2%, 1 to 100 K epi, okay? Now for any type of infiltration, I always use articane. 4% uh, articane, again, 1 to 100 K epi, and this is gonna be just, this has an extra ring on it, better penetration through the bone. Uh, most of the time, I do not give palatal injections, because the articane is able to penetrate the bone very well. So keep that in mind, that's gonna be my go-to. Now, mepivacaine, this is the one solution here that does not contain epinephrine. And of course, for medical, medical reasons, various medications, um, maybe the patient even just had a reaction to epinephrine one time, you wanna always have a, a non-epinephrine option in your office. Um, Epivacaine is actually a fairly concentrated solution. It's just that, of course, the reason we use the epinephrine is to constrict the blood vessels and keep the solution in the area for longer. And then, of course, bupivacaine. Bupivacaine is very, very helpful to have. This is going to be your long-acting local anesthetic. And this also has epinephrine, but in the 1 to 200 K range. And so this is really nice as a long-acting local anesthetic. If a patient's in a lot of pain, it's going to last a bit longer. I always say also, you know, we're not getting into diagnosis here in this particular uh, presentation, but when a patient presents your office in pain, they cannot leave in pain. That would be unacceptable in my mind. 
So if you're unable to diagnose which tooth it is, or you don't have time or X, Y, or Z, always give a few carpules of bupivacaine. And the reason is, is because local anesthetic in the long acting form will help to break the pain cycle. And even if your patient's going to still hasn't had treatment, right? But let's say it's late in the afternoon, you don't have time to treat, you're not able to treat the tooth, give long acting, they'll go home comfortable, which is the most important thing that they leave the dentist's office comfortable. And it will break that pain cycle, it gives you an opportunity to get them going on some appropriate analgesics, and it allows the patient's pain cycle to break so that when the anesthetic aesthetic wears off, they're not in as much pain. Take that as a great little tip. It really works. Okay. As far as syringe tips, again, there's various brands. I just had this one picture I threw up there. There's a million brands, as you all know, different gauges, different lengths. Uh, you'll see that the three red arrows really indicate what I typically use in my practice, which is going to be the yellow 27 gauge, the 32 millimeter has great reach back for the inferior alveolar nerve block. Uh, we have the short 30 gauge blue, which can be used for the PDL and intrapulpal, which I'm going to demonstrate and show uh, in this program. And then lastly, the, the 25 gauge, the 25 millimeter 30 gauge. So the regular blue, which is going to be great for your infiltrations, uh, can also be very, very useful in intrapulpal as well. So these are just the basics, right? Just the basic solutions, the basic tips. And now I want to talk about how do we anesthetize that symptomatic dental patient, right? And I'm going to go with irreversible vulpitis because the reality is that necrotic pulp is not very difficult to anesthetize, right? We know this because there's really no tissue in there. It's that irreversible pulpitis, that inflammatory mediator that's just infiltrated inside that tissue. It's angry. It's on fire. And we need to calm it. And so I want to go through sort of the continuum that you would want to use. And so we're going to talk about each of these injection types. But reality is, is let's say it's a maxillary tooth. I'm going to do local infiltration. And the maxillary teeth, quite honestly, just aren't as challenging to anesthetize. You have the opportunity for, uh, for a local infiltration on the buckle. You have an opportunity for a palatal. You have the opportunity for a posterior superior alveolar if you so choose to do that. Be mindful that that has a higher risk of hematoma. So we want to be careful with that, always aspirating. But I want to talk mainly about the lower molar, right? The, the one that requires the inferior alveolar nerve block, uh, that, that's going to be the more challenging one to get anesthetized typically. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about PDL, and it, which, which is also considered intraligamentary. So that's going to be your just PDL right into that, into that PDL space. Of course, the intraosseous, which can be very, very helpful, especially in more resistant cases where patients just are not getting numb. And then ultimately, the one we rely on and the one that I think general dentists in, 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 in general don't do enough of or feel confident with, that's the intrapulpal injection. And that's really a necessary skill to have when you're dealing with these types of cases. So first I wanna talk about the gate control theory. And the reason I say this is because in every video you're gonna see me, I, I do a lot of rubbing and shaking, right? I learned about the gate control theory in my residency. Um, if you're not familiar, this is just great information and it's so obvious, but I don't know if it's ever, if you've ever seen it coined this way. So the gate control theory of pain asserts that a non-painful input closes the nerve gates to a painful input, which prevents pain sensation from traveling to the central nervous system. So basically what it's saying, as you'll see, uh, what, what is the gate control theory is that the gate control theory is why rubbing a boo-boo works, right? Because the impulses, think of like an elevator going up, sending impulses to the brain. And what really happens is that that rubbing sensation, that movement, when you rub, when you bang your knee into the wall and you, and you go right away to rub it, is that the non-painful stimuli can reach the brain faster than the painful ones. So the gate control theory, and you can read on this slide, I won't, I won't read the slide for you, but what it's really doing is it's allowing you to sort of jump the gun on the painful response by inciting a non-painful stimulus. And that's a rub, a shake. That's why some of these vibrational type of instruments work to help patients with anesthesia. So whether using a manual syringe or some newer technology, which I'm gonna describe, Using some kind of movement, a rub, a shake, anything like this, it works. And the reason is, is the gate control theory. Just think to yourself, I'm able to sort of almost make too much noise in the brain for it to feel the needle going in, 
right? And so that's a really important part of technique. And so just think to yourself about how you can incorporate some type of movement like this into your own injections. So we're going to talk about the local infiltration first. Um, so this is an example where what I like to do is I'm going I'm to play the video here in just a minute is I like to move the cheek, okay, and the lip and just kind of get started with it. And then the concept that I was taught in dental school, which has really proved to be very, very effective is the idea that you don't want to put the needle into the tissue. You want to bring the tissue over the needle. And if you can move the needle a little bit at the same time, it is absolutely magic. I had a patient today and it's every day, but I had a patient today. I tell you this honest truth. And I gave him two infiltrations for tooth number five. And he looked at me and he says, I feel really numb, but I don't, did you give me some type of injection? And I said, I did. And he said, did you not use a needle? I said, no, I did use a needle. And he was just absolutely just blown away. And the idea of whether you're using a manual like this, is the concept of pulling the tissue over the needle versus poking the tissue with the needle. And that's why when I see a lot of doctors using a mirror and then they, they're creating space and it's just a mirror and then they sort of punch in there, I don't do it that way. You'll see I always use my hand and my finger. So take a look at how I do a local infiltration here. So you're going to see I'll first have the patient open so I can see where I am and then I have them close. Now you're going to see I'm going to start to do some movement here. Right. I'm going to do some rubbing, shaking. And then what I do really subtly is I'll turn the needle. Now I'm using the Caliject here, which I'm going to discuss a bit later. But the idea is that when you have something you can hold with a pen grip versus a manual, it's a little bit easier to maneuver. But it's still totally possible with this. You just it's just a little pull over and like this. So you're going to see as this is uh, what we consider computer assisted local anesthesia. And so you see, I still continue to do a little rubbing on the cheek and you're gonna see the plunger is coming down. I, I'm gonna show you how this unit works, but that's through a foot pedal. So I'm pressing on a foot pedal and this plunger is coming down. Now in a moment, you'll see when I let go, it will aspirate. So um, I do very, very few, if any, injections with a manual syringe anymore. And that's what I'm hoping to share with you in this program is what options are available. But again, just think about pulling the tissue over the needle, doing some rubbing and shaking, gate control theory, and you're going to be have some really happy patients. Um, this is going to be, uh, forgive the videos and it's the highest quality, but again, gate control theory. See how I'm sort of just kind of rubbing and shaking and just a tiny little turn um, as I'm giving this injection. I'll go to a better video here so you can see um, so now, sorry, go ahead and play, buddy. Video does not want to play. There we go. So now again, uh, still using the Calajac, but again, you'll see how on the lower, instead of a lot of rubbing and shaking of the lip, I'm rubbing on the anterior of the mandible of the ramus. So this is a great gate control stimulus right here. Just a little rubbing, just kind of going up and down. Patients do not feel the needle. They don't feel the injection. Um, it's a combination, obviously, of, as you'll see with, with computer-assisted local anesthesia, it's a bit slower. Now you see I've gone over and I'm rubbing from the outside right along the masseter. And mainly that's for my own comfort. And then I'll come back and I'll do the inside. So if I can share anything with you that really works for me in my practice, it's this. It's the gate control theory. It's creating stimulus that's faster to the brain than the pain. And when you can do that for patients, they will absolutely love and adore you. Um, and as you can see, just very patiently, you see the plunger going down. You see how it backed out. That's going to be the aspiration function. So one thing that I think a lot of doctors are concerned about with some of these new technologies is how do I know how can I aspirate? And they, they have that all built in. So now, okay, let's take our patient, for example. It's number 19, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis. When we percussed it, it was very, very painful. When we put cold on it, they lit up out of the chair, lingered for 20, 30 seconds. Okay, so now what we've done is we've given our two carpules of 2% lidocaine, and now that patient's starting to feel lip signs. Okay, the tongue is big. Oh, doc, I'm so numb. We can never trust it though. And what I'm going to go through and show you in just a moment is that we always want to retest. So for instance, let's say now on this number 19, I've given my block, patient has lip sign, has tongue sign, but what do I do? I retest it with the cold. 
because I want to make sure that that nerve is quiet. And when it's not, we can always give another block, which can be very helpful. But having the PDL injection at the tip of your tongue and, and having this skill is really, really important. So as you'll see here, this is going to be with a manual syringe. And so what I'm going to do is I always want to be clear. The bevel of this needle should face the bone, not the tooth. That's a nuance of this technique that's important. And you'll see now I'm going to use my finger and I'm going to, you know, push down on the plunger. I'm going to really give it, give it some fire. And of course, this is taxing on me. Um, after doing endo for 20 years, my thumb has its days where it's good and has its days where it's bad. So this is with the manual though, and you'll see the tissue sort of blanches there. This delivers the solution through the cribiform plate, which can be a little more effective. So keep this in mind. Now what I would do is test it again. Do the patient, does the patient feel any cold? If the patient does feel cold, then we really aren't ready for our access opening just yet. But if the patient now finally, you put that cold on there, they don't feel it, it's time to move on to the next step, which would be getting ready. Now, I want to contrast the PDL injection I just gave with the manual syringe. And now I want to show it to you with the Calijac, which again, I'm going to describe in a little more detail here. You know why my videos are being so finicky. Uh, but this is going to take all that stress and strain off of me. So what you're going to see is, is again, the same kind of setup. And if you'll notice, it's all the same needle tips that, that I would have used on the uh, on the manual syringe I'll use here. And now what I'm basically doing is the same technique, but I'm doing it with just pressing a foot pedal. And so you'll see I'm doing this little sort of back and forth. What that does is it just allows that needle to sort of embed inside that, that cribiform plate and inside the PDL space. Again, the key component here for a PDL injection is that the bevel of the needle should face the bone, not the tooth. So you have to pay attention to that, okay? Now, let's say we've done all of this. We've done our blocks. We Patient has lip signs. We've done our PDL. Patient is just simply not getting numb. The other option that we always have is going to be intraosseous. Now, I'll be honest in telling you that it took me a while to sort of get the hang of this. And if you look at that picture in the upper left, that is the whole point, right? You have the, this incredible thick cortex of bone on the buckle, uh, oftentimes on the lingual as well. But then inside of it, you have that cancellous bone. And within that bony space, you can actually dispense solution and it can have a very, very profound effect. Now, obviously, if we're going inside the bone, essentially, we're, you have to consider that you're basically inside of a vessel. So we never want to use epinephrine in there. So we always are going to use on the pivocaine type of, of solution to be able to do this. But if you look at these pictures, and I couldn't quite get a good enough video to uh, to share this with you, but it's it's on my list now to, to capture, um, is that you're going to basically use this perforator. As you can see in picture A, that's going to be a, a, a handpiece that has a coupler that works right on your high-speed airline. And... You almost have to just sort of tap at it because you're basically getting that tip through the soft tissue just manually and then activating the rheostat and sort of tapping into the bone. So you can see on the on the right side there, the, the right side picture, you can see it's sort of in that just below the base of the papilla, sort of angled down, trying to get into where the, the, the soft bone is. Now, I would tell you that comb beam is a phenomenal tool to help with this because it helps you to see where the cortical bone might be a little bit thinner. Now, one trick on this for everyone to know, because it might change the game for you to use this, is, is to use the alveolar ridge. So obviously, many, many patients have had their wisdom teeth extracted. You have just a thin layer of tissue, and then you can pop right in from the top there. So all the instruction that you'll see is showing you this application from the side, from the buckle. But you can go directly down into the crest, and it works beautifully there. So basically, once you have, and you see picture A, you've kind of got the perforator in, and you can sort of feel it. Um, uh, upper left, again, you can see where the tip is now inside that medullary or, or, or soft bone. And so now what we do is we're able to pull the handpiece away. And if you look in picture B, there remains sort of a little cylinder to keep the space. It's through this cylinder, as you'll see in picture C, that you can dispense the solution. Now, you know, a half a carp typically does it, you know, maybe three quarters of a carp, but you don't have to do a ton of solution because you have such direct access to the nerves with this technique. So. Again, this is a lecture in and of itself, but I wanted to mention that the intraosseous can be great. The docs that use it and love it, really, really love it, but it is a little bit intimidating. It took me a while to sort of get the hang of it, 
But what I would tell you is, is if you do have the opportunity to go right in the top of the ridge where maybe a, a first, uh, sorry, a second molar or a third molar has been extracted, that's a phenomenal place to punch through. And that can make things a little bit better vis visible, visibility wise, but also from an effectiveness standpoint. So intraosseous is great. Typically after this is done, you don't really have a lot of problems. You can begin your procedure. So let's jump in here and talk a little bit about the intrapulpal. <clears throat> so this is the key. No matter how many times you get lip signs, no matter how many times you test with cold and the patient doesn't feel it, it's so important. This is the communication I was referring to earlier. The way we communicate with our patient in these situations, symptomatic irreversible pulpitis is everything. So I'm going to tell the patient, okay, ma'am, yes, all right, we're about to get started. You know, thank goodness I was able to put that cold back on there. You didn't feel it. It's great. But I wanted to let you know, it's still possible you might feel a little something. And if you do, I'm going to be right there to take care of it. Don't you worry. But if you do feel a little something, it might be a little sharp, a little cold. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of it. It's totally normal. Okay. Now, the second we get going Can inside we here, tissue? we're going to want to make sure that we test right? The second I see any type of heme or pulp tissue, I'm going to take my explorer. You feel anything? You feel that at all? Because you want to get in front of this right away. And sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes you can be working for quite a while and then they feel something. So it's always important just to reassure, hey, if anything comes up, just let me know. You can give a little medicine right inside the tooth there. They'll take care of it, no problem. And just be, just be doing this. The other thing I like to do is I like to say, Oh my goodness, Mrs. Smith, I can see why you're in so much pain. Oh, this tissue is just so agitated. If you feel anything, just let me know. But this is why it's been bothering you so much. And it just keeps painting this picture of the fact that number one, you're acknowledging their pain, which is really important. Sometimes people feel like, ah, oh, it hurts, but I don't want to complain. You know, I don't want someone to think I'm, I'm, you know, crying wolf or what have you. So you're just validating, oh my gosh, I can see why you've been so miserable. And then the best statement is, you're going to feel so much better after this. So it's kind of acknowledging them, carrying them along and painting the picture of what's ahead so that if they do feel something, they're not freaking out and they understand why. And so I just think it's important to have this level of communication on these cases because no, you're not going to get it numb perfectly every time. And number two, if the patient's on board with reality and you've set that expectation, it goes smoothly and they understand and they're much more sympathetic to you, not necessarily being able to get them like zero where they never felt anything the whole time. So let's take a look at what it looks like to do an intrapopal. To reach into that tissue, as I mentioned, it changes. All right, Frank, just a little pinch here for a second and then it's gonna fade right away. So I get right back to that spot. You're gonna feel me here for just a second. A little bit of pressure. Okay, so now we can see- And then you always retest. Back. Okay, so the key here is if you'll notice, I came in and I had to really give it a, a big push with my thumb. And like I mentioned, my right thumb is not my strongest uh, uh, part of my body right now after a lot of years of work. So now what I'll do sometimes is I'll come over the top with my second hand. So now instead of one thumb pushing it, it's two because the key to the intrapulpal is that it's a pressure injection. So I had this wonderful instructor in dental school named Neville McDonald is at University of Michigan now. And he used to say, it wouldn't matter if you put Diet Coke inside that tooth. It's a, all about the pressure when it comes to intrapulpal, which means you can't be timid. You want to give it. So I always say, you're going to feel a little something on the count of three, one, two, and three, you give it. And then it's like, whoop, they feel it for a second and then they don't feel it. Now, this is in the pulp chamber, as you just saw, but there are instances where sometimes we'll want to then give it down into each individual canal. So for instance, let's say I'm working on that number 19. Now I've gotten it opened up, got the chamber open, started to clean the canals, and then all of a sudden I start measuring for working length. The patient sort of gestures that they feel something. Oh, you feeling that, Mrs. Smith? Okay, no problem. I'm so sorry you're feeling that. But here, this is just what we were mentioning. You know, sometimes as we're working, you're going to feel a little something. But guess what? I'm going to take care of it for you. Now I take the long 30 needle. And now instead of that short one in the chamber, I can take the long one into each and every canal and give it one more little intrapulpal. 
So the intrapulpal injection is so key and paramount to be able to getting these cases complete. I don't know how we can do it without it. And I think there is some perception that endodontists are wizards of anesthesia and they don't need to do things like this, but this is absolutely what's happening in basically every endo office every single day, okay? So let's talk a little bit about so, you know, when we're doing, and I wanted to sort of have a continuum of those techniques, but the key element here is you're doing your diagnostic test to determine the diagnosis. The most important thing I can stress is you have to redo the tests after the patient is feeling some numbness. So the lip signs don't really count, although it's a good indicator, right? At least you know you hit the mark and you've gotten the block in place. Cheek sign, um, okay, great. You know, the patient feels real numb up on the cheek with a local infiltration. But the money is where you can put the actual test, like percussion, like cold, and you reapply that test and they don't feel it. Until you get to that point, you really can't start the procedure. And why? Because if you spend all that time getting the rubber dam in place, getting everything ready, starting your access, and then they feel it, now you've got to take all that off. You've got to do it all over again. So always be sort of moving in a way where your goal is to first diagnose which tooth it is. Most important thing in this of anything. Once you've identified that, start the local anesthetic process, but always be retesting. And when you retest and you can get to negative, it tells your patient two very, very important things. Number one, it tells your patient and shows them how conscientious you are. When I say, listen, Mrs. Smith, I know you're feeling really numb right now, but because your tooth has been so agitated, just allow me to test it again because I just want to make sure this is going to be comfortable for you. That tells your patient so much about you. Number two, you're really understanding that in, if you're going to hurt a patient, hurt them with a cold test, right? As opposed to hurting them deeper down inside. So the reapplication of the diagnostic test is so important. And so typically the scenario, we've just gone through all the, the little uh, techniques here is again, local infiltration, maybe a palatal on the maxilla, uh, inferior alveolar nerve block, maybe a long buckle if you so choose, right? Some, some doctors will talk about infiltration on the lingual, totally legitimate if that's what you choose, choose to do. Give the patient some time. I usually will wait a good seven to 10 minutes. Um, if you're using buffering of local anesthetic, I've had some success with that uh, with faster onset, but I haven't had a tremendous amount of success with it, which is why I'm not going to discuss it very much here in this program. But buffering is also an option. So now we let the patient kind of dig into it. They start to feel it, retest. Everything's good. We get started. But we always have that intrapulpal in the back pocket, and we're always testing to make sure. And it's always great if you can continue to ask, you feeling okay? You doing all right? Do you feel that at all? I'll even say, okay, I'm going to make a little more progress down the roots. Let me know if you feel anything. And I'll go down. I'll say, okay, there's number one. Feel anything? Nope. Okay. Here's number two. Feel anything? Nope. Here's number three. Feel anything? Nope. Great. You're doing fantastic. This level of communication is so important because if the next time I go into Canal 3, they feel something, then I can say, okay, no problem. I've got you. I'm going to take care of it. But if you get in front of it and you're opening the opportunity for them to communicate, I myself have been a patient at dental chair and I felt pain and didn't say anything. There are a lot of patients that will not say anything because they, they don't want to complain. This is a big thing. So when you give them that open opportunity, it's really important. So retest with the cold. This is the way I like to do it. Cotton pellet, metal beak really let the frost get on there. Now you have something sustainable that you can bring to the tooth and retest it. Obviously percussion, back end of a rigid instrument, just give it a little tap. Um, here's cold again, applying it to that buckle surface first, occlusal, lingual, they're all legitimate, but typically start with the buckle. The percussion test, again, little light tip tapping, again, explaining to the patient. Now, when I did this the first time, it was very tender. Now after anesthesia, they don't feel anything. So we're in great shape, okay? So just a quick reminder. Now, when you have intraoperative uh, pain, we just talked about, there's a couple of different options, right? The rubber dam uh, can come off, right? So in essence, you could just take the rubber dam off. What I like to do sometimes if it's an upper tooth is I'll just take the rubber dam frame off and then I can give another infiltration with the rubber dam still in place. Same thing with a PDL. Many cases, depending on how it's fitting, you could do another PDL if you felt necessary. Let's say you have not attained the level of the pulp chamber yet. 
You ha- you can't give an intrapopal just yet. So these are opportunities where you can actually take the rubber dam off, of course, and reproduce and redo your, ta- your sorry, your injections, or you can leave it on. So imagine just folding the dam back and giving another infiltration or PDL. So just wanted to throw that out there to you. And then ultimately, I want to talk about some new technologies that really are that win-win because they're really great for the patient, but they're also really great for our bodies. And I think we have to be mindful of that. Now, I'm going to put them in two categories, foot controlled and hand controlled. And I've tried most of these. I haven't tried the, uh, the, the upper right one from AZ Dent. So two important things to consider. We've all heard of the wand uh, on the left side, okay? The wand has a lot of parts. Uh, so the little wand that actually um, you inject into the patient um, and what holds the carpule, that's a disposable piece. So you can see that sort of kind of uh, added into the top of the unit. This, the wand also is plugged in. So it's plugged into a wall. Um, the Calaject, which you see on the lower left there, that is chargeable, but it's also cordless because you can pull the charge cord out. It has a battery. Um, and you can see the wand. You can see the foot pedal there. That was what I was demonstrating. I'm going to get a little bit deeper into it. Now, the other three are variations. There are many of these out in the marketplace. Um, again, are these an advantage over the, the manual syringe? Absolutely, because you don't have to push them with your thumb, right? So it gives you a little more flexibility. But I have, and, and the reason I'm going to, because I'm I'm going to move into a discussion on Calaject, because I sort of looked at the marketplace, I tried a bunch of these, and that's what I chose. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you would necessarily choose, but the reasons I chose the Calaject, I've never looked back because it's so useful for me. But what I found with some of these on the right side of the pink line is that once you get into position and now you have to start manually controlling something, it changes the perception for the patient. They they can sometimes feel you moving around. Maybe you change a setting. You're starting, you're stopping. So I found them to be a little bit clumsy. Just my opinion, not saying it's bad, not saying you shouldn't use it, just my opinion. Whereas on the left side of this pink line, you have foot control. And I think when you can get the the needle in and now the, the hand does nothing but remain a steady support and all the action is through your foot, It doesn't jostle the patient as much. So I'm going to move this conversation into the Calaject. Again, uh, some of the reasons why I chose this, and I tried them both. I want to be up front. Uh, There was a disposable cost to the wand, and it's just much more difficult to change the carpules. Uh, What's nice about Calaject is there's nothing disposable. That little plastic cylinder where you see the uh, carpule in there, that's autoclavable. So you're just basically using your regular needle tips, your regular uh, solutions, and you just you just go with it. So that was the reason for me. But I would say I would skew more toward the left side of this pink line because I don't want a hand control. So this is computer-assisted local anesthesia. That's what Calaject means. Um, and so this is something um, from a company named Ronvig in Denmark. I happened to get an ad one day for it. My shoulder was aching. I was having this pain point and I tried this one after having tried a few others and it really seemed to help me. So let me show you how it looks, how it works, and I'll be able to answer some questions. That is that in order to deliver a comfortable injection, you really have to put your body into a compromised position. So in this manual syringe, I will get myself in a position where I am shaking the lip or cheek And now I have to also, with my forearm tensed, now push this solution through with my thumb, which I would really identify as the biggest pain point in my entire procedure. Pushing this through with my thumb, I'm going to be more erratic, and the rate is probably going to get faster the longer I'm sitting in this position. Introducing the Calaject system, which is computer-assisted local anesthetic, allows me to hold the unit with just a, a finger or pen grip be able to deliver the needle in and then literally drop my left arm and control the entire process with a foot pedal. They know exactly the most ideal, comfortable rate of flow. And so the Calaject captures that by not allowing the human element of pushing it any faster. My primary reason for adopting it is my own comfort and my own ergonomics, which allows me to practice stronger and longer than I would before while delivering the most comfortable injection possible for 
So let me show you a little bit more about it. And again, I'm just like legitimately, this is what I use in my practice. I have them in every room and I get so excited to share it with colleagues because it's made such a difference for me. So let me give you, I did a review video on the technology. So I want to give you just a little more information. And again, happy to answer any questions uh, that come up. Here is that this unit allows you to control the speed of flow of the anesthetic solution in a way in which the patients really have minimal, if any, discomfort at all. I find that patients are very excited about this technology. I think it's a great practice builder because so many patients fear the needle. They fear the local anesthesia. And this really is a solution for that while allowing the doctor to maintain an incredible ergonomic position that is so kind on the body that it really takes away what I would describe as one of my greatest pain points in my whole procedure, which was giving local anesthetic injections with a manual syringe. So let me show you some of the functionality. So take a look now, here. It has this incredible wand. The wand is very well weighted. And this wand has this base here, as you can see, which holds it in place. So this barrel is autoclavable and can be used over and over again. We use them many, many times. They're very durable. And then, of course, you can attach your needle tip, which would be disposable, right to it. So you do a little twist here. And just like you're accustomed to on a regular syringe, it screws right in. Then you take your solutions, whatever carpule is appropriate for the patient, whatever you like to use. And this goes into and attaches to the wand. So once this is in position, what you'll find as the clinician is it's so nice to be able to use a pen grip. A pen grip gives you a lot of flexibility as you're bringing this into the tissue, including, as you can see, a bi-directional ability to do a little turn. And I find that when you pull the tissue over and you give a little turn, the patients literally do not feel it to the point that they're constantly asking me if I used a needle, which is the greatest feeling as a dentist to have your patient ask if you've used a needle when you have. So what happens with this, the way that it works is it powers on and it has a plunger that will come up and slowly push out the solution at just the right rate. The key with Caliject is the rate of flow. This unit calibrates that rate so it's ideal for the tissue to accept it. Now, when we start on the first level, so there's a few different functionalities to it. From giving injections and having my arm up in the air, trying to make it more comfortable for the patient, that I started to develop a lot of shoulder issues. And Caliject was actually the answer for me. I purchased this for the specific need that I had to be in a more ergonomic position when giving local anesthesia. And it has absolutely fulfilled that. And I've been using it every day. It's the only anesthesia injection I'll give. And I've been doing that for the last four years. Okay, let's take a look with a clinical simulation. So in this simulation, I'm going to use the number one setting, which is going to be essentially for a PDL injection. So this is going to be a great opportunity to really get the tooth numb in a single fashion through the cribiform plate through the PDL. This also, this short gauge 30 needle is also really nice for palatal injections. And I always use the number one setting for my palatal injections as well, because it's so slow that it's much more comfortable for the patients. So let's first start with that palatal injection. So in this case, we're gonna find where that greater palatine nerve is, and you can use a little distraction with your finger, or you can just give that little rotation again, which is really critical. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start the dispensing of the solution. And what it has in this number one setting is it also has an auto flow. So after five seconds, I'm able to let my foot off the pedal and be able to have an auto flow. Once I touch the pedal again, it will stop. But if you don't prefer the auto flow, you can just continue to leave your foot on the pedal. And again, this is gonna be the palatal injection. Now, when I'm doing a periodontal ligament or PDL injection, I really wanna have a distinction where I want the bevel of the needle to be facing the bone, not the tooth. So I'm gonna take a look at where the bevel is and I like to give just a little bend on the needle like so. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna find the line angle and I'm just gonna tease it underneath like so. Now, when I activate the foot pedal, there's gonna be a pressure sensitivity to this, which is gonna cause the pressure bar to start to increase. So I am looking at that pressure bar as I'm giving PDLs, number one, to ensure that it's getting in there effectively, because if there's no back of pressure, then there's not gonna be really a PDL effect. But also it's gonna give me an opportunity to realize that if it gets too pressurized, meaning the plunger is having too hard of a time pushing, then it's actually gonna shut the unit down and shut it off. So there is a safety feature with these PDL injections. So again, this is the one setting. This is going to be a slower drip meant for the PDL. I sometimes also use it for intrapulpals, but PDL and palatal injections mainly. 
Okay. So I hope that that gives you just some, some sense of what is available to you as far as technology, that win-win. And I also just wanted to talk about just really quickly, because I, I really like to talk about the human element of what we do. Um, and, you know, when you look at that little picture and it's like, you know, stress and wellness, it's really just the letters on that first block. And you can make that shift. And a lot of it is that we're, we're functioning in dentistry in a fear-based mindset. You know, we're always thinking about what's going to go wrong. You know, what mistake, what might we make? Am I going to hurt a patient like a, like a patient with irreversible pulpitis? And what I ask is that try shifting into more of a healer-based mindset, meaning you're here as a healer to help your patients. And when you go at it like that versus it's all about you and what might happen for you. And of course, we carry a ton of liability with what we do in practice. But when you just shift your mindset into a healer-based mindset, a lot of that stress sort of falls away. I like to call this the endo-success mindset. And one way that we can do this is just with deep breathing. You know, the, the power of one deep breath in your day, it's like a reset, it's oxygenation, it's, it's getting into your blood, into your brain. You can really kind of shift your mood, shift what just happened in room one, because now you've got to walk in and start all fresh again in room two. So I always like to teach, focus on a deep breath through the day. I like to use cues, like when I give local anesthetic, I always take a few deep breaths. When I wash my hands, I always take a few deep breaths. You don't have to make it obvious. No one has to know what you're doing, but it's really, really powerful. So anyway, a few closing thoughts with the hot tooth, set expectations with your patients, talk to them, let them know this is not a normal tooth. We're going to get you through. I can understand why you've been in so much pain. And if you feel anything, which you might, I'm here for you and it's normal. We'll take care of it. Again, always retest the tooth. So critical to be able to do that because you have to be able to be efficient in dentistry. And if you're putting the rubber dam on prematurely, you're going to have to take it right back off. That's just a waste of time. So always confirm with your tests. Remember that gate control theory. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. And it will absolutely just, you sort of are just sending impulses to the brain that block out the pain. And try some new technology, you know, find your win-win. The Caliject has been absolutely magic for me, but there's a lot of options like I showed you there. And so if you enjoyed the webinar, if you like the way I teach, uh, you can hit that QR code. Um, I've got an online program called Access Endo Impact Academy. Um, it covers both endo and personal wellness. And I'm just really here. I, I'm really committed to supporting dentists. We have a very, very hard job. It comes with a lot of wonderful rewards, but it is hard. It is hard mentally, physically, emotionally. And so the more we can do to educate ourselves, invest in our education, take care of ourselves, the better. So again, if um, I'm Dr. Brett Gilbert on all the social media channels, I uh, would love to connect with you if you have any questions. I'm always trying to post pertinent content that will help you. And, um, and thank you so much for, for attending. And uh, Lisa, I'm happy to take any questions if they came up. Okay, does intraosseous work for extractions too? Uh, yeah, um, intraosseous. If you've never done it, Roya, uh, it's phenomenal. I mean, it, it, it. Now, the caveat is that not every patient is going to be a good candidate for it. And again, if you have comb beam, it's a great way to sort of screen patients because you can just see how thick that cortex is. Uh, but you can come in at different angles, just trying to catch it. You know, just again at below the base of the papilla, uh, just trying to angulate if there's a certain area you can feel. Uh, but yeah, I mean, anesthesia is anesthesia, so it definitely would be helpful for extractions as well. Um, I'm puzzled. I'm a fairly new dentist, so my luck with IAN is 50-50. One day it works, and others it doesn't. Any recommendations? Yeah, so you know, it's that median rafe. It's just that little the way that the muscle and the ridge of the bone come along. What I like to do is, you know, you saw me doing a lot of rubbing. What you can do is you can kind of feel around to the mandible. Um, and I'll flip it around like this. So inside the mouth. So find that anterior ramus. That's always a great guide point. And then they always say, if you kind of envision it, like at the level of patient's mouth is open at the level of like the palatal cusp of the maxillary molar. It's up fairly high. Uh, the honest truth is, Victoria, most of the time when I miss, it's because I miss low. So, so that's something to keep in mind. So identify the anterior ramus and then start to feel back toward their ears. So you get a sense of the of turn around the width of the mandible and then just do your best. Just try to get it up there. Obviously, if you can feel for bone, if patient ever jumps, 
Um, you always ask, just stop, don't inject and say, did you feel that on your lip or your tongue? And they'll be like, no, it's just in the back. Yeah. So you always want to confirm because if you do get that sort of electrical stimulus and you've actually touched the nerve, you don't want to continue there. You want to withdraw it. Uh, but the honest truth is my guess is you're probably missing low and that's why you're having a low percentage, but it does take time and every patient's anatomy is a little bit different. So stick with it. Um, yes, I always use topical. I don't think it literally does anything personally. I think it's, it's like just, but patients expect it, patients want it. And so I always do use topical. So I just use a little of the topical benzocaine or, or whatever. Um, Oh, Lou. Yes. Great question. Septo or Lido and the PDL injection. So the funny thing is, is at some point there have been a few small studies that snuck in there that might have indicated that uh, septicane is not as good. It could cause damage to the PDL. I don't really have any verifiable evidence for that, but I typically use lidocaine for the PDL for that reason. Similar to the paresthesia articles uh, regarding articane, it just doesn't make sense to use a solution when you have others available when there's some type of study that sh might show that it's, it's negative. But I don't truly believe that there's much of a difference. Um, Anonymous, uh, I noticed when working on cracked teeth, uh, tooth test negative to endo ice, when prepping for a crown, it's all good until the crack is touched. Any suggestions to improve it? Well, this would be another opportunity. Again, that cold test is really great. So if you are giving anesthesia and uh, for any, any type of uh, procedure and you put cold on the tooth and they don't feel it, it's a great sign right? And so you can use that even if it's not an endo procedure, just as a way to sort of just double check yourself if you have profound anesthesia. Uh, any benefits to warming the anesthetic? I don't know of any. I know that there are products that do warm it. Um, so I don't particularly warm it myself. Maybe it goes in a little bit easier. I don't know. Uh, but I don't have any any type of evidence for that. But I also don't have any evidence to say that it would be bad if you've used it and that seems to help. So um, oh, you're welcome. Yeah. You know, I could, I could go on for hours on this topic, but, uh, 50 minutes was all I had, but I hope the video has helped. And, you know, if nothing else, just to see that gate control theory, I live by that. When I learned that it was like something just opened inside. And now, even before I started using Calject, I was always complimented by patients. And again, remember it's that pulling it over the tissue, right. As opposed to puncturing the tissue, Right. And then if you have the opportunity to use a pen grip, being able to just turn it a little bit as you do it really, really helps. Um, Gal gates. Yeah. Gal gates can be very effective, especially if the patient is not able to open. Right. So that's going to be median, uh, medial to the uh, ramus of the mandible. Um, so, again, you're still trying to get into that uh, inferior alveolar nerve before it enters the mandible. Uh, Calject aspiration. Uh, the Calject aspirates. Yeah. You just literally let your foot off and then you can push right back on. There are certain settings where it will go from high speed to low speed automatically, or where you can actually tap the foot pedal in a certain way, and you can change the speed on your own. So it, I have to say it really has a lot of flexibility for how, however you like to practice. So I hope that that answered, um, answered your question, Don. Uh, thoughts on buffering? Yeah, like I said, I've had, lim I've had mixed results with buffering myself. Um, sometimes it really is, you know, meant to give like a much faster onset. And I have had cases like that, but then I also had cases where it didn't seem to make a difference. It's not cheap either. So, um, I sort of gotten away from buffering the last few years, but I don't see any harm uh, with it. And I think that if it helps you, then it, it's a worthy endeavor. So, um, yeah, I do prefer the inferior alveolar versus the gal gates in general, just because I have more visibility and control. The gal gates is a little more of a blind injection. And again, because you can get it back there pretty far, you're not necessarily able to see the anatomy as well. Again, be very aware of that in the posterior superior alveolar, be very aware that the hematoma risk, I think is a little bit higher. Uh, Todd, would you expect, uh, an intraosseous given through the crest posterior to 31? Yeah. It does that, Todd. Yeah, he's asking, like, can you use that to anesthetize the lower jaw there? I mean, absolutely. And I had a friend named Mark Palo who actually is the one who taught me that technique to go through the ridge because it's not really listed. In, and I hadn't really seen it before. And I, it's been an absolute game changer and a, and a case saver for me. So um, septo for blocks? No, not for lower blocks. Um, the reason you were probably told is because the literature – 
Yes, I believe the literature in total supports the use of septicaine for blocks, but there are studies that show a higher incidence of paresthesia. So if for some reason your patient gets a paresthesia and you did use septicaine, an attorney is going to grab a hold of that and they're going to they're going to throw it at you. So when I see these types of studies, whether I agree with them, whether I think they're well done, whether I think that any of it is valid, I typically will avoid it if there's another option. And of course there is. So I typically stick with lidocaine. Oh, you're welcome, Don. I'm Alex. When using a Calajac, silver piston, pulling back after the cartridge is emptied, you wait until the piston is full. Yes. So yeah. So um, once that once that cartridge is empty, so that piston has gone all the way down, there's a little button to retract it. And if you try to pull the anesthetic uh, cartridge off without it being retracted, it's very, very inefficient. Um, and I don't think it's good for the machine either. So I typically will go ahead, I'll pull it out. I'll go ahead and hit the retract. I'll put it in, obviously, into the in single-handed like this. And then I'll be able to, um, you know, give the patient a little rinse. Um, as soon as I'm finished with that, I'll just unscrew it, put the next carpule in, and away to go. Away I, away I go. So it sounds like you might be using it already, Alex. Um, if you ever give them a Pivocaine first prior to Lido, um, I don't personally, but um, it's not a bad thing. I, I don't, I don't typically try to mix them together if I don't have to. I'll typically try to stay, um, you know, just stay consistent with it. So very honored to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you all. And if you have any questions, you can always reach me. Again, social is the best place to do it.